Hey community, in today's interview, Matt sits down with author Zach Hicks to talk about the role of a worship pastor. There's a ton of things that a worship pastor does, what is the ultimate role of a worship pastor, and how can worship pastors continue to serve their teams well. Be sure to check out Zach's book, The Worship Pastor, A Call to Ministry for Worship Leaders and Teams, and enjoy the interview. What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Loop Live. My name is Matt McCoy. I'm the founder of loopcommunity.com and the host of the Loop Live show. Today, we've got a great guest on the show today. It's Zach Hicks, the author of The Worship Pastor. This is a great book for your worship team. Uh, If you're a worship pastor, you got to check out this book, The Worship Pastor. We've got a ton of really interesting things we're going to talk about. I've got some questions lined up that I'm excited to ask Zach. And uh, wherever you're watching this video, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, go ahead and type down in the chats any question you might have for Zach as we're talking in this conversation. And we're going to actually take some live questions if we get some good ones. So type them in the chats. We might pick it and answer it live. But uh, without further ado, let's bring in Zach. Looking forward to this conversation. Zach, What's up, everybody? Going? Hey, good to see you. Glad to be here good today. To Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So give us just an overview of who you are, what is it that you do? Yeah, so I grew up in Hawaii, in Honolulu, Hawaii, till I graduated high school, went to college in LA, studied music there, met my wife, and we both moved to Denver and pursued ministry calls, the both of us. She's in kind of counseling and stuff like that. I pursued being a worship leader and doing pastoral stuff, and we thought we were going to live in Denver forever. God called us to Fort Lauderdale. And we lived there for three years, and now I'm living in the American South in Birmingham, Alabama. Never thought in a million years I'd live here, but here I am. I've been serving in local churches for about 20 years now in various kinds of worship leading pastoral roles for that amount of time. And I sort of fancy myself someone who is a practitioner uh, who thinks about what I do. And so a lot of my life has been straddling that doing stuff and then thinking about it and thinking about it with others. Were all of those moves because of church jobs? Yes. Yeah. It's something that I've wrestled with God over because it's had an impact on my faith and life and family. Not always positive, you know, moving around has its cost and not staying with one local church for a long time has its own set of costs as well. And, um, And it's been itinerant. I don't know why the Lord has chosen me for such a constant nomadic kind of ministry, but it's, it's been that way. I've seen a lot now. And I think that maybe part of that is, is so that I can share those experiences with others. Um, But yeah, I have to go to therapy. I have to pray a lot, have to, you know, do all the things to undo the effects of feeling rootless, you know? And so we're working on those roots right now. We're sticking around here for a while. Yeah, that is really hard to move around so much. Did you always see yourself being a worship pastor? Yeah, funny enough, I thought that God was calling me into classical pastoral ministry when I was in the 10th grade, went on a youth retreat, had kind of an experience with reading scripture and sensing God calling me into pastoral ministry. And it was around that same time that God gave me um, musical gifts. So I was kind of a late bloomer musician and went in studying music in college kind of blind. Um, and so what happened was I headed towards seminary thinking I'm going to be like a preacher, teacher, hospital visitation guy, that sort of classical pastoral work. But the jobs I was getting while in seminary and after kept on being those worship leading jobs. And I was sort of wrestling with God, like, uh, when am I going to be a pastor? When are you going to make me one? And sometime down the road, uh, the Lord opened my eyes. Mostly it was through interactions with the people I was serving, but I was beginning to realize this is pastoral ministry. That's sort of what led to the book because I, on yeah. the other side of having that revelation for me, which shouldn't have been a revelation, I began asking the question, why is it that worship leaders don't think of themselves as uh, doing pastoral ministry? And so uh, all that stuff kind of came together for my own call. So yeah, it's complicated. I always sense myself being a pastor. I've always ended up being a music and worship leader. And I've seen over the course of time, oh, those things aren't different things. Yeah, it's so interesting that then you write a book, which did you ever see yourself becoming an author? Like, tell us a little bit about the book and where the desire to even write that came from. Yeah, it's funny. So when I began producing music for myself, I had a kind of 
uh, Jerry Maguire style figure in my life, a sort of agent kind of guy, just a good friend who knew a lot about marketing, knew a lot about how to, um, and this was in the early 2000s or late 2000s when blogs were just ascending. And yeah. he told me, you know, if you want to promote your music, you need to start a blog and get lots of like content on your blog about worship. And you're articulate about that stuff, Zach. So just go write articles and it'll drive people to your site and they'll check out your music. People did come to the site. Everyone was interacting with my blog, but no one cared at all about my music. <laughs> and it kind of became the yeah. tail that wagged the dog. And I realized, oh, uh, there's something that I think God's sort of showing me about the gifts and call and skill set. Of course, I'm still going to produce music, but maybe uh, the ministry I have for the broader church is in writing. And so that kind of clued me in. And the Lord brought a few people my way who were friends who just gave me advice about writing. I always thought I wanted yeah. to take Pastor Tim Keller's advice. He said, no one should ever write a book before they're 50. And I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. And then um, this whole pastoral worship leader reflection stuff, I began to have conversations with other pastors who were looking for worship leaders like me, who were sort of pastorally minded and theologically kind of uh, trained either formally or informally, and who knew how to yeah. reflect on those things as a worship leader. And uh, I began sending them my sort of personal research notes of books I'd read that I'd found meaningful to help me understand my vocation. And one yeah. pastor in particular came back to me and said, you know, this kind of looks like a book outline. Have you ever thought about uh, writing a book? And I said, well, Tim Keller says you shouldn't do that. And yeah. he said, but I feel like worship leaders need what is said here now. And I don't see anybody saying it. And the spirit use that to just sort of start driving that train. And so that's how yeah. the book came to be. It was through a lot of people speaking into my life. Yeah, that's so great. I love it. So even so far in our conversation, we've interchangeably used the terms of worship leader, worship pastor. Yeah. Yep. Can you explain what the difference is between the two? Does the title matter? Is there is there a difference? Yeah, I think ultimately on the ground, the title doesn't matter. Uh, the t and here's the reason the title doesn't matter, and then I'll argue with myself about that. Uh, the title doesn't matter because whether or not we have it in our title, what we're doing is inherently pastoral work. When we sit down to select songs, when we lead people in prayer, when we make aesthetic decisions about worship, uh, what we'll include and what we'll exclude, those things are inherently pastoral decisions. So the title is kind of irrelevant. And, uh, you know, I sometimes speak on this topic and I get some worship leaders coming up to me kind of nervous because it's like, hey, I don't want to be a pastor. My church didn't call me to be a pastor. And I know what pastors have to do. And that's not my role. I, I yeah. work in a denomination where that's a very specific title for very specific people who have, uh, you know, ordination and a certain kind of skill set and calling. And I said, that's fine. I'm not tied up about the title. If you need to use small P pastor or not at all, minister or anything, it doesn't matter. The The big point is that the things you do have a shaping and formative effect on the people's walk with the Lord. The prayers that you put on their lips with the songs that they sing often become the prayers that they uh, sing and pray to God on Monday through Saturday. And we often don't realize that our decision making for the sake of Sunday ends up reverberating in people's walks with Jesus Monday through Saturday. That's what I mean when I say uh, that a worship leader is a, a pastor. In a sense, I'm kind of taking a cue from the Reformation. The Reformation argued for the what's called the priesthood of all believers, that God doesn't set aside a certain class of people to be um, particularly connected to God and be, be mediators between God and humanity. Really, through Jesus Christ, we all have direct access to the Father. And I think there's something analogous in that every Christian, in a sense, has a calling to pastor other Christians, to, uh, you know, in some sectors of Christianity, we say to make disciples. So I think that part of the worship leader's disciple making call as a Christian is to think uniquely about how I make disciples through mm -hmm. the normal things that I'm already doing as I'm standing in front of people and as I'm planning for that event. What would you say is the ultimate role of a worship pastor? Yeah, I'm going to be super spiritual and give you a Jesus juke, but I actually really mean it. Yeah. I think that the ultimate role for a worship pastor is to point to Jesus and his finished work in everything they do. I could tease out a lot of other things, 
like in my book, um, I sort of outline a bunch of different metaphors for what I think um, a pastoral worship leader should function as. I, I outline things like a worship pastor is a church lover, a war general, an artist chaplain, a mortician, an emotional shepherd, liturgical architect, and a bunch of other stuff. But I think if I had to boil it down, I'd say it's we are people who are the opposite of mediators between God and humanity. We're the people who point to the one who is. So, um, you know, in, in a lot of worship leader talk this these days, we use the language of us being the people who usher people into God's presence. And in one sense, I get it. I get that part of our primary function is to uh, aid this experience and encounter with God. And I, maybe the language of usher works because an usher isn't the center of attention. An usher is someone who kind of points people to that direction. But it makes me itchy too, because sometimes we end up thinking that we're the ones that are going to be doing the work yeah. of Allowing bringing people. Yeah. And that's Jesus' role. I mean, that's the book of Hebrews. Yeah. It emphasizes that Jesus is our ultimate mm -hmm. worship leader. So, Insofar as we can do a good job of pointing to him, who he is and what he's done week in and week out, we fulfilled our function as worship pastors and leaders. So you probably know more about the history of this more than I do, but it seems to me like the whole idea of a worship leader as an occupation, as a job, seems to have skyrocketed in the past 10, maybe just the past two decades or something. Um, yeah. Is there anything about that that worries you or concerns you as far as the occupation, someone pursuing worship leading as an occupation? Um, well, sort of. <laughs> Let me describe it by a particular encounter I had. Um, I was asked to guest lecture at a university in a, in a big city that has a big reputation for music. I'm trying to be vague here. Um, and this university is, is a kind of a semi, a, a university with Christian heritage mm -hmm. that has a kind of Christian ethos to it a bit, but plenty of people who uh, are not Christians and would say they're not Christians attend this university. Yeah. And I was asked to guest lecture in a class and it was a worship leading class. Um, and one of the things that the prof sort of uh, helped me understand ahead of time, he said this, this you're going to think this is weird, Zach, but not everybody who's an aspiring worship leader in this class is a Christian, nor do they think that that's important. <laughs> wow. um, they recognize wow. that as someone who wants to be like a singer songwriter, that it's a stable career to have like a, a major gig in a local church and that they can get the job done of what the church mm -hmm. wants them to do. They just need a good singer, a good guitarist, someone who knows how to rehearse and lead bands and sing songs well in front of other people. And so they've wow. seen this and they've said, hey, that's a stable career so that on the side, I can do my side hustle of writing songs and gigging yeah. and getting famous or whatever, you know? And I was like, man, that's mind blowing to me that anyone would uh, want to go into this with a clear sense of like, oh no, this is not anything spiritual yeah. for me or anything connected to the church or Jesus. And I'm not a Christian. It's just a stable job. And that yeah. was hugely illustrative of, you know, it's a little bit overblown because it's one specific place, uh, but it showed me, gosh, that's the state of our vocation right now. Yeah. And it does concern me a little bit, not the job, not the fact that this job exists in local churches right now, because I think there's actually almost ancient precedent for people in God's community being set aside specifically for the, I'll use priestly as language, uh, the priestly role of leading other people in Music in particular, you see it in the Old Testament. I try to outline this in a talk I'm, I'm doing for Church Front that should be out soon. Like, where do we get the title worship leader? Where is it from? And I, is it biblical? And I wrestle with that. So I think that, that in theory, it's fine. But as it is cast now, there's something worth asking about the fact that if churches are creating a climate where someone who is not a Christian can think this can be a viable career for me and churches yeah. are at least some churches are out there okay with that. Um, something's awry in the whole system. Something needs a little bit of a check, uh, whether you want to yeah. talk about the over-commercialization of it or the compartmentalization of the song leader away from their pastoral function. You yeah. know, That's sort of where I tend to think about is like, how can a person who 
doesn't know Jesus pastor others. They really can't. They don't have the spiritual equipment because they need the gift of the Holy Spirit in their life, which they don't have. Um, and so why is it that churches will, why will they put someone in that role? You know? And yeah. so there's something kind of wonky with the system worth processing. Yeah, that is interesting. That would definitely be a red flag if a church is okay with that. Yeah. But it, it is interesting yeah. that, you know, for any musician getting paid full time to do it, to do music full time is a dream. So I can oh, totally man. see why yeah. people would see yep. that as wow. Like where else can you get paid full time like just to do music? Totally. Awesome. I don't I don't I don't fault the people yeah. <laughs> who are non Christians thinking that this can be good. I mean it's yeah. it's an incredibly stable and wonderful thing to do yeah. and it's it's fun. It's a really yeah, fun, fun job. I know I was talking to Paul Balash, who was saying, I think I asked I asked him a question of what would you tell a worship leader who is feeling burnt out? Mm. And he was, he essentially was like, listen, you're, it's not like you're laying bricks in the hot sun <laughs> five days a week. He's like, you're playing music, man. Like you get to play your guitar, you get to sing songs, you get to worship the Lord. And yeah, there's some administrative tasks that go along with it and pastoring elements that are always complicated, you know, with people. And But we need to have perspective that like, it's not like <laughs> you're uh, breaking your back over it as far as like, physical hard labor like we get to play music and i just thought it was interesting because it was a very like just practical response yeah it's a different answer it's kind of like hey suck it up it's not as bad as you think it is kind of yeah <laughs> and you know and that's like a that. good that's a good word i mean some of us have sort of uh you know soft spines these days and um just have forgotten what it's like to labor hard in what we do yeah. you know at, at the same time burnt out worship leaders man there's yeah. all kinds of real trauma that's a real, real issues yeah. And I, I minister to plenty of them. I am one, was one, have gone through yeah. that. And certainly I know Paul has too. Yeah. I mean, the man's been yeah. a faithful worship leader for decades. And so I know he's gone through cycles yeah. of that kind of thing. And it's complicated, but that's a good word. You know? Yeah. Maybe it it's just, you got a good job. Just, <laughs> yeah. Just coming back and thinking about the joy of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, definitely. I get to sit here and drink a cup of coffee and just look at planning center. <laughs> and put, come up with a cool, you know, a good set list. Even the word set list, you know, is strange. But like coming up with a sure. good order of songs that are going to really help our church engage in worship. I think it's, if we come back to that, it kind of sets perspective. One thing that I think worries me a little bit about the whole occupation of worship is it seems to be that there's a shelf life for worship leaders. Yeah. And that worries me because I'm like, it seems like, I see churches rolling out, you know, moving out the guys who are in their fifties to bring right. in the new young model, <laughs> the younger version, the new model. And I just think that maybe churches are kind of uh, forfeiting some depth and experience and pastoral depth for uh -huh. someone who can just come in and sing really well and look the part. And I think that does worry me about the occupation of worship leader. Yeah, I remember this subject. This is a real live wire. It continues to be that. When I was in my blog heyday, when I was trying to drive people and get the SEO and all that stuff, one of the articles I wrote that had a lot of traction was uh, worship and ageism associated with that and, and the shelf life of a worship leader, the burnout. And yeah, I mean, if I cut, were to cut to the chase about it, I'd say we have drug in some major idols of culture. And some of the idols of culture that we have that ancient cultures and other cultures around the globe don't really share is mm -hmm. this kind of idolization of youth and prizing of young and uh, moving off into the side. Those who are old, we don't want to see old people. We want them to die in nursing homes, not in our yeah. homes. We certainly don't mm -hmm. want them in our life. As soon as we get signs of aging on our forehead, we Botox them out. So we're just yeah. like an anti-old culture. And the funny thing is, um, when I talk to older worship leaders, they're some of the most wise, seasoned, pastoral uh, people. And it's funny, I talk to churches who are looking for worship leaders, and you can feel that ageist uh, desire in there for someone young. And yet yeah. they have all these qualifications that I say, man, some of that wisdom doesn't happen yeah. until you have the years under your belt, you know? Uh, and so you're looking for a unicorn. You're looking for someone impossible. You're looking for someone in their 20s who has mm -hmm. got the wisdom of someone in their 40s. Um, and there's no way to really shortcut what 
you learn through relating to people, through making mistakes, through planning yeah. songs that uh, give give you the haters, through getting fired on Monday for something you do on Sunday, all those things. You know, they teach you something about serving the local church. And that wisdom, sadly, is not something that we prize right now. We prize youthful good looks, the best pe- best looking people. And we certainly prize uh, just a good good optics up front. And we need to repent of that. Yeah. And unfortunately, churches have probably had to learn the hard way on that one. You yeah. Know, where it's a revolving yep. door. You know, the young worship leader doesn't stick around long um, yep. for various issues. Who knows? But... I think that's a really interesting thing that churches need to be thinking about. Is there something, what's the, what's the biggest thing you see worship leaders or worship pastors neglecting in their life and in their occupation? I feel so strongly about this. And of course, I'm making a generalized statement and there's going to be a multitude of exceptions. But um, especially now that I'm teaching in a, I'm teaching worship leadership in, in various environments, but one of them is in a university where I, I get these wide eyed 18 year old aspiring worship leaders. And one of the things I'm just noticing is that worship pastors and leaders are neglecting reading, studying, and meditating on scripture, putting themselves in front of the word of God on a regular basis and choosing to be mighty in scripture above all else. I mean, there's so many things that Our culture and our churches are demanding that we know. I mean, the pandemic demanded that we become technological experts who know our way around live streams and mixes and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And um, in the middle of all the things that we probably do need to know for our very complex vocation, what I see being lost is a robust hunger uh, and knowledge of the word of God. And I think that's the most important thing. I'll take a worship leader any day who's saturated in the word of God, because what Mm -hmm. happens is when you soak in it and then you're upfront leading the songs you choose, the prayers you pray, they're just scripture's going to come out. And I'm a firm believer that the Bible itself is, is a harbinger for the presence of God. Spirit and word always come together. So when we're filled with the Bible, we're filled with the spirit. And when we lead out of that mode, we are leading spirit filled saturated worship and God yes. will meet us there and you know we will encounter him in his word. So yeah, I I, I think this is going to be a drum that I beat even more strongly mm-hmm. because um it seems like the trends are that we're only becoming more and more biblically illiterate rather than literate. I'm so glad you said that. I kind of had a feeling you were going to say that because I I've, <laughs> I've seen that as well. It seems to me like a lot of worship leaders spend a lot of time just wanting to learn how to use tracks, how to use technology, how to use planning center, how to use live streaming, how to learn parts better in a song, how to figure out guitar pedals and technology and totally neglecting um, the, yeah, biblical literacy. And I will say, actually, I will be the first to admit that, you know, I was a worship pastor full time at churches for almost 20 years. And I did not read the Bible much. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I piecemealed it. I would read, you know, sections. I would read my Psalm a day, maybe a proverb a day or whatever, but I wasn't like being saturated in the word. And in the past two years, when COVID started, I actually got invited a couple guys from a church that I don't, I had actually never even visited before invited me to join a virtual Bible reading of Professor Horner's reading plan, which is a very intense reading plan. We are reading 10 chapters a day. And the idea is not to study specifically like really deep into each scripture, but it's to be saturated in scripture every day, constantly just soaked in it. And we've now gone through the Bible three times in that two years. There's just intense reading. You read the same stuff over and over and over and over again. And I will say for me, my experience as a worship pastor and a songwriter, my worship leading and my songwriting has never been richer and more tender and more just really in tune with what God's doing. And it's because I like know his word now. Yeah. And when I'm singing songs now, I think of scripture and it's just, it's everything every single day. And I do think that that is something that is seriously lacking in um, worship leader development. So I hope that you keep beating that drum because I'm going to beat it with you. I will. 
Yeah, that's awesome. There's an intimidation factor in reading the yes. Bible because here's what happens when you read large chunks. I'm sure this happened to you too. It raises more questions than it answers yeah, because it uh, what people will tell you uh, who have been in the word a lot is that when you read the word, the word actually turns on you and starts reading you. And that gets real uncomfortable real fast. Yeah, when you, right. when you start having to wrestle with these complex questions of God and evil, it actually thrusts you into relationship with God where you're like, God, yeah. I'm feeling uneasy about the you that I see here. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm struggling with that. And what, what are you doing right then? You're actually relating to God through his word which is precisely yeah. where he wants you. you know. So I think that we can absolve ourselves of feeling like we need to be theologians and understand everything we're reading. And the simple right. practice of just opening, just reading and going, I don't get everything, uh, but man, the spirit will meet you there. When the word is open, that is the playground of the Holy Spirit, is the Bible. And I think sometimes we compli make it complicated finding God. Like, where do I yeah. find God? It's been so long since I found his presence and felt him. Yeah. You know, yeah. people like Luther would say, if you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear God yeah. speak out loud, read the Bible out loud. <laughs> and yeah. there's the truth there, you know, uh, it's very simple. But there's a reason why God didn't leave us to our own uh, devices and desires. Yeah. He yeah. Uh, gave us a revelation, a word that's yeah. written for us and uh, through time has just proven faithful so uh, I do. I commend that to every worship leader I talk to. And I see the ebb and flow of my own health and my own lack of health almost correlated to how, mm -hmm. um, how much I am maintaining a kind of presence and saturation in the word of God. Yeah, it's so important. I think you raise a good point, too, that we maybe just take it maybe too, sorry, not to say it this way, not too seriously, but I think we get intimidated by it because we yes. think we need to like study it and like understand everything yeah. but you have to be okay like just let god speak to you and yep i like i think nathan finocchio said uh it's less about studying the shape of the leaf and more about just seeing the shape of the tree mm. and yep. when you're doing like intense bible reading like that it's more of just understanding the shape of the tree of god of the yep. overall god story and you know the other thing too is it becomes more familiar to you the more you do yep. it I think yep. about, uh, sorry, and I'm kind of going off on this little soapbox here. I love it. Go for it. My experience was I kind of relate it to the Bible seems intimidating if you haven't read it all before. It's almost like if you've never been to New York City before, you're like, how am I in the yeah. world? Am I going to find my way around? And you're not, you don't know the subway system. You don't know the restaurants. You don't know. But once you've been there, if you lived there for like three months, six months, it starts to become so familiar and you know your way around yeah. it easily. You don't even need a map anymore. You know which lines to take and which restaurants to go to and what streets go where. And I, I feel yep. like it's like that. When you start living in the Bible, it just becomes more familiar. You see the connections. You see how to yep. how how things are, are connected together, how to get around, and it's just less intimidating. I love so, that. Yep. Good so word. Zach, I've got a question. So in addition to your book, The Worship Pastor, which I recommend everyone go check out, um, are there any other books or resources that you highly recommend for worship leaders? Is there a worship book that you really like that maybe impacted you a lot? Yeah, I'll kind of go through a, a litany of various sort of sub subjects within worship. But the first thing I want to say when I was, you know, pondering the question of a resource for worship leaders actually directly in line with the discussion we had is I think one of the most helpful things for worship leaders to read, uh, but I would say more specifically to pray is the book of Psalms. Here's why. Mm -hmm. uh, the book of Psalms are God's CCLI top 150 charts. You know, we have our own. God has his top 150. God has a, a selection of inspired worship songs there for us to regularly pray. And here's the deal. When we regularly pray them, we're going to start wanting to choose songs for our people that mirror the breadth and emotional depth of all that those psalms have to offer. They're going to start pointing out the gaping holes that are in our worship songwriting today and maybe send us backward into the past to find worship songs that actually uh, address those subjects that the psalms did. And maybe yeah. we'll actually sing some psalms too. Some, there's some great yeah. settings of psalms right. out there now. Uh, but the reason I say particularly the Psalms as well is because uh, I like the way the reformers put it. 
John Calvin called the Psalms an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. So in a sense, when you read the Psalms, you're getting every part of you engaged with God, which is a formatively fruitful practice for a worship leader to make sure that body, soul, mind, every faculty is being addressed and is constantly pouring itself out and being poured into by God. Martin Luther called the Psalms the little Bible. He sort of likened it to the idea, if I read the whole Bible and then prayed that Bible back to God in response, I would have the Psalms. And I think there's a really good case for why that's true. You know, So in a way, the Psalms are kind of like uh, the prayer form of the whole scriptures. So if you if you want like cliff notes of the Bible itself, you pray the Psalms regularly and it's sort of like a, a laser focused saturation in mm -hmm. the whole of scripture. And the way I, I like to demystify praying the Psalms and I simply say like what I do is open up Psalms uh, and read them to the Lord, pray them to the Lord. Many times yeah. I'm kneeling. Many times I'm just, and I'm not elaborating. Sometimes, you know, once every fifth time will I get stuck on a verse and be like, gosh, I need to talk about that with God. But most of the time it's just verbalizing the text of scripture to the Lord and yeah. trying to make my heart mean it as I pray yeah. it, you know, to work through yeah. the motions of pressing the alignment of my mouth and my soul. So I'd say that that's the resource that I'd recommend for worship leaders. Now I'm going to go through a quick battery of just some specific things. I think worship leaders should know the history of contemporary worship. So there's a new book out there called A History of Contemporary Praise and Worship by Lester Ruth and Lim Sui Hong that I highly recommend. It's going to open your eyes to some of the water that we're swimming in. It's like understanding your own culture. Um, on Worship and Formation, I love the book You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. On worship and arts and the formation of various art forms in a worship service, Glimpses of a New Creation by David Taylor. On worship and the gospel, I recommend the first 50 pages of uh, a, a book called Worship, Community, and the Triune God of Grace by James Torrance. And then on a theology of worship, a really thick book if you want to get in those scriptural weeds about worship in the Bible, uh, Alan Ross's Recalling the Hope of Glory is is the book that I'd recommend. Wow. You just gave us a treasure trove of books to yeah. read. Um, actually, if you could even send that to us, we could put that in the description notes here because that is, those are great recommendations. I really appreciate totally. that. Will do. And then, of course, everybody, make sure to go check out uh, The Worship Pastor. Zach, I appreciate you taking the time to join me on this conversation. It's always just fun talking to other worship guys about just worship and uh, the interesting occupation of worship leader and all the different kind of things that come along with that. I appreciate uh, just the wisdom and the heart that you have for pouring into worship leaders. So thank you. For oh, that. man. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, you don't need me to do this. You didn't ask me to do this, but super huge mm -hmm. fan of Luke community. Grateful for your ministry to Christ oh, Church. Thanks, it has very tangible application for me as I was using my fairly newly purchased um, Looptimus pedal in, oh, cool. in a worship service, helping to run some of my uh, Ableton tracks. You know, totally. Yep. There you go. So free advertising. Uh, it was yeah, useful cool. to streamline some things that I did and actually simplified it so that I was able to do what I was supposed to do, which is to uh, lead others uh, in engaging the presence of God. So uh, technology, cool, yeah. praise God for it. Thanks for what you all do and what you provide for Christ Church. Thanks, man. It's awesome to hear that. All right. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll connect again soon. All right. Peace. Yep. See ya. All right, you guys. I really enjoyed that conversation with Zach. Zach, thank you so much for joining us on that. Hey, with what is one thing that you're going to walk away from this conversation with? I would love for you to type down in the chats, in the comments, wherever you're watching this on Snap, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, type down what is one thing that really stuck out to you about this conversation? And then, of course, if you're not already subscribed to our channels, make sure you hit the subscribe button or the like button to follow us for future Loop Live shows. Thank you, Zach. Make sure you go check out his book, The Worship Pastor. I'm sure it's on Amazon. And uh, probably if you just Google it, you can find it. And uh, go follow Zach wherever he is. And um, thank you guys for joining us for the show. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, this is Matt McCoy. Thanks so much for tuning into today's podcast. We're trying to provide content that's really helpful and meaningful to you as a worship leader. So make sure you hit the subscribe button to stay tuned for more from the community.